Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts with the presence of God's love. Transform us more and more into the likeness of Jesus, who we follow. In your name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. And happy birthday, church. Today, we celebrate the feast of Pentecost and recall how the gift of the Holy Spirit emboldened the early church to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in the world. And as we make our way out of pandemic, any reason to celebrate makes good sense to me. But today, we have more reasons than most. Declining infections, effective vaccines, a baptism, confirmations, receptions, and all dressed up in red. Hallelujah. Let us remember, too, when we speak of the Holy Spirit, we are speaking of God. In the very beginning, Scripture tells us how the Spirit hovered over chaos to bring forth life. And in today's first lesson from Ezekiel, we hear how even dry bones can be reconstituted and given hope by God's breath. Nevertheless, I think it would be fair to say that the Spirit has a very special relationship in the life of the Church. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no Jesus movement, no Christianity, no Church. And from the beginning, the Spirit has shown a keen appetite to inspire, surprise, and yes, even shake us up a bit when we become complacent and self-satisfied. Now, I'm not suggesting that the God has sent this pandemic to wake us up, but there can be no doubt that since the church has left the building, we cannot, we must not, simply go back to the old ways. Over time, the Church Universal has been split around the ways in which the Spirit manifests herself. The Pentecostal Church and her charismatic cousins regularly experience speaking in tongues, healing, and the casting out of demons. We, on the other hand, prefer a more classical, refined, and intellectual expression. Unless it's a UK basketball game, of course. <laughs> but it does not have to be one or the other. Every year on the 18th of June, the feast day of Bernardo Mizecki, a Mozambican catechist and martyr who planted the church in what is now Zimbabwe, Tens of thousands of Anglicans gather for a weekend of prayer and celebration. Many of the participants are women from the Mother's Union, an enormous sea of blue and white uniforms. The first day, people gather in groups scattered around the remote forest near Marandera. At night, they light campfires, and filled with the Spirit, people begin to move. Preachers and prophets spontaneously stand up to proclaim the word of God, and the people respond with choruses and dance. The earth almost trembles with the lament and joy to the God of their salvation. Throughout the night, prayers for healing are offered at the high altar, and the power of God has been seen to work powerfully in that place as lives are changed. The next morning, hundreds of vested clergy, bishops, walk in formal procession, led by crucifers, thoroughfares, acolytes, choristers, and catechists, and surrounded by a myriad of ululating voices, 
They sing the same wonderful liturgy that we will say here today. Liturgical to the core, evangelical in its proclamation, and charismatic in its exuberance. This is the spirit-filled church of Africa, and we have much to learn from her. Just like the early church of Peter and Paul, this church is vibrating. She boldly and joyfully preaches the good news of Jesus so that lives are changed and the world healed and restored. In both the scriptural account of the early church and in these communities, we see the breath of God pushing the church outwards to be a missional people sent into our neighborhoods. Jesus tells his disciples in the gospel, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify. It is a belief in Jesus and the reception of the spirit that enables these disciples to bear witness. This profound personal experience transforms their fear into courage and changes their despair into hope. That still holds true for us today as well. Peter's message makes it clear that this is the same gift that Jesus had promised, and it is neither incidental nor a temporary phenomenon. Quoting the prophet Joel, he tells us that the Spirit is for all God's people, those who believe in Jesus and are open to receive God's gift. This is the accumulation of what God has been doing to put the world right again and shows the interplay between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as it resonates with both power and promise. You see, the Christian message is not meant to be some private, personal, interior self-help therapy. It is a cosmic rescue mission to save all of humankind and the creation. The spirit of truth exposes our unbelief in rejecting Jesus and brings our life of shadows into the light as the violence, evil, and darkness of this world is overcome. This is what began on Pentecost. The disciples, both men and women, were enabled by the Spirit to share a message of new life for all people from every tribe and nation, and the church was born and sent. I remember once walking back from a conference, confirmation service on the lakeshore in northern Mozambique. It was a terribly hot day, and I was tired from the four-and-a-half-hour service. Ours won't last that long. <laughs> Having eat, eaten our lunch, we were retracing our steps on the two-hour hike back to the village where we stayed. And on the path, we met a group of intoxicated young men. They, too, were filled with spirit, <laughs> but this came from a local distillery, not the breath of God. They were playing very loud music from a solar-powered boombox that badly needed repairs. And they danced and drank with glee. Obishpu, they shouted when they saw us coming. Come and drink and dance with us. I had zero interest in spending time with these drunk young men. And so I gave my excuses, avoided their embraces, and hurried past on my way home. 
When I arrived at the parish house, I was greeted with a hot cup of tea, a lovely piece of bread, and cool water to soak my feet. It was blissful, but I was troubled. The spirit was up to her mischief. I could not stop thinking of how I had been invited to share time with these young men, but ignored the opportunity. I felt uneasy, convicted, guilty. And so I put on my shoes and headed back toward the sound of the dancing men. They greeted me with the same unbridled joy as the first time, shared their beverages freely, and draped themselves around my shoulders as we shuffled to Bob Marley, Bonga, and Miriam Makeda. After a while, I begged their leave, but I invited them to Mass the next morning. Ten of their number arrived, looking a little worse for wear, but sitting in church nonetheless to hear the good news proclaimed and to celebrate the sacraments of new life. The Spirit brings hope in the strangest of ways. And we need to be constantly refilled because even the most ardent disciple leaks like a sieve. If, like me, you are sometimes unsure of how to act or what to say, don't worry. Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. The effectiveness of the message does not depend on us. We need only be faithful. The Spirit empowers and links us together as Christ's body, not a power over, but a power to, for, and with others, so that we gain the ability both to see and hear the need and the opportunity all around us, and then are given the courage to act with God in Christ's name. Let us all take the words of the prophet Joel to heart and begin to dream dreams and make prophecies and see visions for the Episcopal branch of this Jesus movement. Energized by faith to proclaim the good news of Jesus, empowered by God to bring healing and wholeness, emboldened by the Spirit at work in each of us, let us together be the church, be the change. Amen.